the same. And this is very similar to what we see in a lot of different industries in a lot of different areas. Success breeds copycats, right? If you are successful in what you're doing, if you are successful, you know, in business, people want to copy you. They want to emulate you, right? And I like this quote, limitations, the highest form of flattery, but it is really annoying. And, you know, if you don't believe me, look no further than Star Wars. I'm sure, has anyone not seen Star Wars here? That, that, well, maybe that's a better, okay. So people love Star Wars, maybe not all of the um, you know, the, the, the multi-movies, but the original one most people have an affinity for. And, you know, back in when Star Wars was released, it bred a whole bunch of other things. Now, how many people have heard of this movie? I can't even pronounce this movie, but have you seen the poster before? This is affectionately referred to as the Turkish Star Wars. So it was actually released in Turkey, and they took actual footage from Star Wars and spliced it in with footage from Battlestar Galactica and other movies and made a version that is so bad, it's epically awesome. I would totally recommend you add this to your Netflix list or wherever you can find it. It's so atrociously bad. But that's what you get is you get imitations of the original and they often, you know, they lose some of that luster. And, you know, even the original creators sometimes go too far, right? So we've got that Star Wars. Oh, I see the head shaking. What, you're, are you a Jar Jar fan? Uh, oh, we've got Jar Jar fans out there. Uh, sometimes the original creators can go too far in what they do. Now, what does this all have to do with open source? Well, open source is a winner now, right? So declared the media, so declared the news, so declared investors, right? Everyone is in love with the open source movement. In fact, you slap open source on something and you get like 2x the valuation on your company. Woohoo! Yay! Let's just slap that logo on there. And because of that, you know, we're starting to see a change in the ecosystem. Wow, that is not coming out. I wonder what that is. Hold on a second. I'm going to try and reconnect to see if that does anything because my photos aren't coming out. Ooh, that's not good. One second. Yeah, right? Like, th this, these should have some pretty awesome non-green, you know, things. Um, you know, but evidently it's just going to be that way. So, all right, well, we'll just roll with it. There's a cool picture here, I'm sure, and I'll provide the slides afterwards. Suspend belief. Evidently, I copied this from somewhere else, so this is a copycat, just like those other things I mentioned. But, um, you know, investors want to follow that same route, right? And so what investors see when they look at a lot of open source companies is they look at how many downloads. Oh my gosh, look at how many downloads they have. If you, if you look at any of the open source companies that have come out in the last few years, you'll notice that in their, you know, kind of their IPO filings, they talk about things like the number of Slack users, the number of downloads, the number of, you know, um, you know, times people, you know, uh, forked it on GitHub, because these are metrics that they're looking at. How can I take that and turn it into something that is monetizable? So how do you take what is awesome in the community and then flip it into something that we can make a ton of money from? Eh, that's really annoying. Um, there's a problem here, though. Um, and so, gosh darn it. Sorry, everyone. I have no idea what's going on here. All of my slides have these beautiful pictures that I spent so much time on, and now none of them are working. It's annoying. So one second. We're going to go to my backup slides, which are in a PDF, which hopefully won't have the same issue. Um, so... That is weird. Uh, but, you know, there, there is a significant problem when, when we look at that kind of mentality. Okay, let's see. I don't know if that will work. No, it won't. So we'll just have to go a little different. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and share my screen again. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Hopefully that's coming up. Did it pop up yet? No signal. Yeah, of course. 
Here we go. Here we go. Yay. Let's do full screen mode. Excellent. All right. But there is a problem when you do the math here. By the way, if you were really interested, see, it was this fancy thing with all these, you know, people on it. But, you know, th there, there, there's a problem with this, um, this uh, thinking of the monetization and just the downloads. Uh, the problem that you run into is a lot of us, as we develop software, we're looking at a lot of the software, especially in the open source space we choose, as you know, Lego pieces, right? So how many people have just one stack, they stick to that stack, and they don't kind of deviate? How many people, like, is it just like, I, I, I'm 100% like old school, like lamp stack or whatever, mean stack now, anything like that? Or are you changing up, you know, maybe databases, changing up app servers, changing up components in the application? That happens quite a bit. And we also, as um, developers and as a, you know, community, love variety. And, you know, we're looking to try new things. So a lot of that, uh, you know, those numbers that come out, a lot of the download numbers, a lot of the metrics that people are, you know, trying to figure out how to monetize, it's because people are trying these things and they're really exciting. And, um, you know, they, they, they give you a sense of, you know, um, hopefully we're okay. <laughs> they give you a, a, an awesome sense of uh, accomplishment when you can achieve something new with what you've got. And so... When the investors started to look at, okay, we've got all of this software that is being downloaded so much, but people like the variety, that means they're not going to necessarily stay with us. They're not going to stick with us. So they needed to come up with a way to take what has been driving the open source side of the businesses, um, that, that adoption, and turn it into money. So they came up with basically the Dune quote of, he who controls the spice controls the universe. And if we make a Lego base plate, everyone will just build on it. Anybody like Legos? I like Legos. They never have enough base plates, right? You can never have enough base plates. But once you build on the base plate, then it's really hard to take off the base plate. And that's what we get in the cloud space, yes, because the as a service, everybody wants you to build your infrastructure specifically on their you know, cloud provider, their as a service. And so we've kind of switched this mode from old school um, you know, downloads and using software as one-offs to this new as a service info, you know, uh, setup. Because the infrastructure space is where we're seeing the massive battleground. When you look at any changes in the open source space, they often start in the infrastructure first because this is where a lot of the investment has gone into, right? There's like 500 database companies out there now that are all doing some open source database. How many cloud providers are out there? We all know the big ones, but there's a ton of little ones as well. So this as a service has turned into something that everyone's trying to use as a way to lock you in. Now, I'm gonna go about five minutes into the boring here because this is really relevant to the evolution of open source business models, right? So from a business perspective, there are many different models that people have followed in the open source space over the years, but there are some common ones that keep on popping up to the top. Now, the first one is companies in the open source space often provide free software and then you pay for help or you pay for some sort of service as you need it. This is often referred to as the Red Hat-esque model of the olden days, right? So, you know, you can use Red Hat, um, you know, uh, but if you want to get the enterprise subscription, uh, then you can get regular updates, security features, things like that. Um, but it's, it's a service model first and foremost. Um, and the problem with that is, if you've ever run a service business, it's very low margin, so you don't make a lot of money off of it because it's you're selling people, right? So as a person, you have to have someone who's there. This also has low stickiness, right? So when I say stickiness, if you have a problem, you pay for someone to come help fix it. Once the problem's fixed, do you still pay them? No, you go on and do your thing. And so this has not been a popular model in a while just because you can't generate a lot of money and you can't get that return on investment that investors are looking for. Open core tends to be um, a, a model that a lot of the, you know, kind of generation one and two open source projects followed. Um, and if you're not familiar with open core, that's where you have an enterprise version of an open source software and you have to pay for it. 
right? This provides a little bit more stickiness, a little bit more value. Um, you know, this is where people will try and get you to move to their enterprise version, um, but you're always disrupted by free. And so I can tell you, I worked at MySQLAB. Um, MySQLAB was constantly fighting with themselves because if you were buying MySQL Enterprise, if you didn't see the value in it, you could go to MySQL Community. Hey, you know, and that is a free alternative. And so you're always competing with yourself. Now, this has kind of led to this as a service. And this is where most vendors, especially in the open source space, are moving towards, right? Because it's not about just you know, the software. It's about letting us, let us completely manage it for you. Um, and the reason that investors love this is it's really high value, but it's quote unquote high stickiness. And what I mean by stickiness is once you install it, it's really hard to get out generally, right? You know, has anybody tried to migrate cloud providers? Was it an easy time, right? You know, it's not, often not, especially if you start tying into um, features or software that are tied into that, you know, cloud provider. Um, and while this makes it easy for users, you give up a lot of control. Now, there is uh, an evolving kind of business model, which is this kind of hybrid model where you take, you know, so software services as a service and you kind of mix them together. Um, but, uh, you know, you still risk disruption in that space as well. So, all of the open source businesses that are out there are moving to that as a service base. In fact, some companies are even ditching open source, like Snowflake has gone to a pure as a service database, so they've kind of moved past it. But I know that there are a lot of companies out there that are now starting to move more towards, hey, we'll give you open source for free, but it's going to be completely unsupported. We're not going to necessarily fix bugs. If the community wants to, that's great. But we're going to have this as a service. And if you want anything that's going to be supported, then you have to pay for us to manage it on our infrastructure. Now, a lot of companies have already started that. And so we've seen some open source companies that have, you know, kind of come out in the space. And this is before the market downturn. All of the metrics that I'm going to show and the numbers I'm going to show here are all pre-market downturn, which is what we're in now. But there were several major open source businesses that had either exits or IPOs in the last couple of years. And, you know, any guesses on how much money these companies have made? Any guesses? Anybody want to take a wager? More than two nickels. Um, you know, any guess on how profitable they are? Yeah, so so here's the thing, right? As you roll through these companies, it's interesting in the open source space. And again, this is where this the money from the investors starts flowing in, and they want that retention stickiness. They want to drive value. Couchbase, right? Um, last year, um, they lost a hundred or uh, they lost thirty three million dollars. So you know they had one hundred three million in revenue, but they lost thirty three million. Okay. Um, valued at $1.2 billion. Confluent. Confluent had $208 million in revenue and lost $229 million, right? And so what I'm saying lost, they spent $229 million more than they brought in, right? So they're not profitable. Um, we look at GitLab. GitLab is in the red $213 million. HashiCorp, $83 million, right? Cloudera actually... Um, went private and actually made almost no money from when they went IPO a few years ago. And they continue to lose money. In fact, the last reported loss was $162 million. And so it's funny because depending on where you fit into this kind of like marketplace from an open source perspective, either these IPOs are the best or the worst, <laughs> right? And I mean, here's two analysts who are saying like, you know, hey, this is the worst IPO of the year because they don't make any money. They don't really have a viable, you know, path forward. And then there's another, you know, person who's saying this is the top software IPO of the year. And there's this uncertainty around can open source companies actually end up being profitable in the long run? And, you know, you, you know, you look at the numbers, even like MongoDB, for instance, or Elastic, um, you know, all of them continue to lose money. And this is what I like to call the eventual revenue model. So it's like the eventual consistency model you see in software and databases. But eventually we will be profitable Just right around the corner, another 10 years or so. And and everyone loves to blame Amazon. So I have to have one slide to blame Amazon in here. I'm going to blame Amazon for this. 
Um, is anybody here from Amazon? If so, I'm sorry, but I'm not really blaming Amazon. I'm blaming Jeff Bezos. That's right. Um, you know, so what Jeff Bezos um, has done is Amazon was a very unprofitable company for years and years and years. Okay. Um, and I'm not talking about the cloud disruption from Amazon. You know, I'm talking about, you know, taking money in and then, you know, not having any sort of revenue uh, or profitability um, in that. Right. So you're taking a whole bunch of money in, you're investing it into the company, into the growth. That's awesome. But there is no plan to eventually make money. It's just grow, 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 grow. And eventually we'll figure it out. Um, and they're you know, shareholders are willing to burn community bridges to try and meet those expectations. And, you know, Bezos has come out and said, and I've heard um, investors, I've heard people in open source companies say, if I ever have any sort of profitability, you should fire me. It all should go to growth. I'm, my whole model is I'm going to go raise more money, get more shareholders, and then just grow, grow, grow until everyone else has gone away. That's what Amazon did, right? took 14 years, but eventually Amazon beat everyone else into submission. 14 years of no profitability. Now, the problem, you know, that, that we keep on running into is when we talk about trying to build a business that is profitable and open source, it is insanely hard. Does anybody here work for an open source company? No? Okay. Oh. So, you're, you, that's that's cool, you know, I mean, that's telling in and of itself. But everybody here uses open source, right? So these are probably from the companies that you are using. Um, you know, we did a we do a regular survey on op the open source community, and almost two thirds of companies don't want to pay for anything in the open source space. They want to use popular open source and just use community support. So two thirds are predisposo predisposed to not purchase anything. Anybody here buy like support from a open source company? One, two, two. So it, so we've got what, you know, 40 people, 30 people in here. And two out of the 30 are paying for some sort of support from a company. And, and so when we talk about trying to build a profitable open source company, it's really, really hard. Um, and the third that do pay are generally focused on support, where it's like, hey, if a bad thing happens, I need this. Well, the problem is, once, you know, who, number one, you know, once you don't have an issue, you don't want to, like, spend the money. But whoever wants to use, you know, insurance, right? I don't want to use my life insurance. Does anybody here want to use their life insurance? I don't. I mean, that, that's a negative outcome for me, right? You know, like, but, you know. Uh, but, our, you know, when you look at, like, these, you know, uh, companies, they're, they're already having kind of this challenge in that open source space. And that's why they're so looking uh, so much look so much looking forward to kind of this as a service future because they control the base plate for the legos they control the spice right and that means that they're really predisposed to try and get you onto their platform and to stay on their platform while they grow and then beat everybody out of existence right and their thoughts and feelings on how open source should be run are very different than the users or the community as a whole, right? So any creators here or maintainers, do anybody have released their own open source software? Okay, one, two, three, three, a few, okay. Um, so your reasons for doing open source or your use reasons for using open source or participating in the community are very different than what you have in the investor space, okay? So, you know, People get involved in open source and in the, this space for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's be, to become rich, right? Some people are like, oh, I want to make a company. I want to have a big exit. But most of us that I found um, get into it because they believe in it. They love it. They care about the community. They see a problem they can solve, and they want to solve it. They contribute because they think that they're going to help the community as a whole. And so... These are the reasons why I've gotten involved, like not to become rich, but because I, I believe in a lot of the projects that I talk about, because I love being in this community. I love meeting with people. But when you look at, you know, shareholder value, shareholder value is completely and utterly different than what we think of in terms of, you know, uh, the values. And this is a, a kind of a, a weird flip right? You know, you look at a couple of quotes. This is from a uh, Linux Foundation blog. Um, 
you know, where it is on the perspectives of open source startups, right? You know, they admit, you know, open source works for adoption purposes, but is really poor for monetization, right? Unless you're monetizing at different levels. Um, the beauty of open source from an investor perspective is distribution, not innovation. So it's all about distribution. Now, when I do open source and I contribute code, I'm trying to innovate or create or do something, not necessarily, you know, uh, distribute more of it. But the models for a lot of big companies are marketing as uh, open source as marketing, right? Um, Dev, the CEO of MongoDB, came out and said, we didn't open source Mongo you know, to get help from the community, make the product better. We open sourced it as a freemium model. Anybody play games on their phone? My daughter wastes so much money on games. These freemium games, you know, you got to buy the loot boxes and stuff. That's what a lot of people are focusing on open source as. It's just the freemium model. And that's a dangerous place to be in. And a lot of that freemium model means that the stickiness, okay, or the lock-in that they're trying to build into these products is real. Once you get in, you can't get out. It's the Hotel California version of uh, open source. And there is a fine line between stickiness and lock-in. Stickiness means, hey, you love the product, so you're going to use it. Um, but, you know, lock-in is where you're stuck, you know, th this is this quote from this analyst who was talking about MongoDB's IPO. And he likened MongoDB to Oracle back in the 90s. Did anybody run Oracle back in the 90s? Yeah, I got one. So Oracle used to do this thing where as soon as you got into an Oracle database, you were stuck in an Oracle database, and then they would send the licensing police out every few years to try and, like, suck more money out of you. Um, and, you know, so Oracle got a really bad rap for their lock-in strategy. And so now investors, analysts are saying, yay, good, look at these open source companies. They've got great lock-in strategies. That should worry all of us if we're using you know, commercial open source software. And that's led to a lot of the licensing whack-a-mole. Um, now, how many people have heard of SSPL or have used SSPL or anything like that? No? Okay, great. Well, we're going to tell you about that. Oh, licensing talk. Boring. Um, so. Most software back in the day was either released as Apache license or GPL, um, which forces you to contribute your code back, um, but enables you to do certain things with it or not. But in the cloud space, you might have seen um, some companies come out and bash Amazon or Microsoft or Google about stealing open source software and making all kinds of money off of it and not giving back to the community. Well, so then people started to change the licenses to play this whack-a-mole, right? So, well, if Amazon or Google take my code, I'm going to change the license. So then we had the AGPL, which has a network clause to help deal with that. But it's not strong enough. It didn't prevent a lot of what was going on in the Amazon space. So then we switched to, okay, now everything's going to be database as a service or SaaS. And then we saw um, a focus shift to what's called the SSPL, or there's also the BSL license, which is um, decidedly an anti-cloud license. It basically says, you can use this open source software unless you provide or you run it in a cloud and you're running your own like you know services on it. And it adds a ton of restrictions. And we've seen several companies change this license over the last few years to keep ahead of this whack-a-mole. Uh, for instance, you know, Elastic. Um, anybody use Elastic? No? Okay. Uh, so Elastic changed their license after saying two years ago, they changed their license two years ago, and they said, we are Apache forever. And in a, in a you know, uh, you know, in a commitment statement to open source. Then two years later, they came back and they go, we're doubling down on open, but not open source. We're changing our license from Apache to, uh, to, uh, SSPL because the cloud is competing with us and stealing our business. And so they made a switch and it really impacted the users and the contributors of that space because a lot of the people who are contributing code uh, to the Elastic space all of a sudden had any code contributions go outside the open source space, right? So they had like 2,600 contributors and that's 2,600 contributors worth of code who all of a sudden had no rights to the software that they, you know, submitted or, you know, provided to them. They signed their rights away when the license changed. 
And that's where it's really, you know, you, you're starting to see kind of this debate between older school open source companies who are looking at license changes like the SSPL versus the as a service offering uh, companies. And I think that, you know, these are typically, you know, the two popular models that are growing, but neither of them are open source, right? A lot of the as a service providers that are coming out are building, quote unquote, open source compatible software which means that it is not 100% open. You can't necessarily get the code. Maybe you can use it like you would, but it has different features. And that's a big challenge. That's, that's something that we need to be careful for. But that SSPL is already being replaced. You look at MongoDB, who created the SSPL, they've already started to switch to the Atlas only, right? So if you've, if you've got MongoDB users out here, Atlas is their database as a service um, cloud. And, now they're taking things that would normally end up in the open source space and saying you can only get it if you're in the cloud. Oracle, what they're doing is they're saying, oh, we're going to enhance MySQL with things like HeatWave. I don't know if you've ever heard of HeatWave. It's their analytics engine for MySQL. And they're saying you can only get it if you're a cloud user, which means you're paying the money. And so more and more of the features that would generally end up in the open source space are now ending up only in cloud providers domains, which means you have to pay for them. And you know what's worse is if you try to move away from that cloud provider, you lose all of those features because they're proprietary to that cloud provider. So if you're using, for instance, MySQL or Postgres, and you're using the Amazon Aurora version, and you try to move to the Azure database as a service, you're going to lose features that existed. And your code might not work out of the box. So it's not really MySQL anymore, it's just MySQL compatible. It's Postgres compatible. It's a very different story. But that current wisdom is, especially from a vendor perspective, is cloud as a service is better than the SSPL. Now, where does this leave us as users of this open source software? Okay, you know, what do we want as users? And I'm gonna use me as an example. Maybe this will resonate with you, but I'm happy to listen to what your wants are. Um, you know, there, there are some similarities, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's different than what we're, you know, trying to, uh, to get out of the investor space, but we do still want software that works, right? We want software that has a vibrant community. Uh, but there are, you know, there are similarities and differences, right? So for me, when I think open source, I'm thinking about, like, the value of the community. Being able to sit here and share of you, to listen and learn from all of you. The collaboration, the ability to collaborate with one another, the freedom, the innovation that's there, the, the equality that we have when we talk about, you know, the different products. And we all, whether you're an investor or not, are looking that, you know, at more adoption and more contri uh, contributions into the community is a good thing. We all want that. And we want more production-ready code. We want bugs fixed quickly. We want data that's secure. Right? So we want all these things. But unfortunately, the things that we want, we generally can't get from our maintainers. Now, for those who do maintain or contribute open source, um, it's interesting. You didn't raise your hand when I said, did you work for an open source company? Because most of the people who are building most of the open source software out there don't get paid to make open source. They just don't. Um, so the companies that can pay are those that are trying to take open source into this new cloud era as a service. They're trying to take things, you know, in a different direction. And, you know, the people who are actually making the software on a regular basis and contribute most of the code out there um, don't have a big, you know, uh, company behind them and don't have a lot of money. Now, there are some companies that are trying to fix this, right? So you, you may have, you know, run into, you know, some of the different projects out there that are, you know, trying to bring, you know, um, some value to maintainers and uh, developers. Uh, Tidelift, for instance, is, uh, you know, spun out of, you know, some folks who used to work at Red Hat. Um, there are people trying to help maintainers build at least a sustainable revenue model so they can work on open source and make it better for all of us. But right now, most maintainers either have to go the investment route, which is going to mean it's focused solely on money and not the community, or they're just going to do it in their part time and they're going to do it for the love of doing the software. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, people like to take the pieces. And so considering that most of, you know, 
our designs, our development efforts, kind of use an open source buffet approach of taking the best pieces. Um, a lot of you probably, um, hey, you're, you're going to take, you're going to use the software. Some people leech the software. Some people will fork it and do their own thing with it. Other people discard it. So they don't necessarily contribute back to the ecosystem or the, you know, the, the community. And because those Lego pieces are interchangeable, it means that a lot of people who are working on the software um, aren't necessarily going to have, you know, a sustained group of people who will contribute and work with them. And that leads to code that isn't necessarily always up to, you know, snuff, right? It leads to vulnerabilities. It leads to bugs because uh, people might be not be looking at all the different areas that they should be because they're doing it for uh, the love of developing or because they want to plug into the ecosystem, you know, help out with the community, but they're not doing it uh, to solve big problems. I mean, how many people were affected by Log4j here? Anybody get affected by that? Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot more people than I thought. Um, but this is one of those things that the code was out there forever. It's just nobody bothered to go update it. And it's one of the flaws of having just this kind of space out there where there really isn't a big group that is focused on the development of it. But it also leads to people doing kind of crazy things. Um, and I'm going to talk about Sabotage, not the Beastie Boys song, but if you want me to, I think I have it on my phone. We can play it later. Um, how many people have have seen, like, the Colors uh, and Faker library th news that came out a few months ago? Nobody? Oh, wow. Uh, one. So, so what happened was we have a maintainer of a very popular JavaScript library. Um, called Colors and Faker. And he got upset um, because he wasn't making money. He wasn't getting traction. He has millions of users of his software, millions of downloads, but he can't make a go of it. So he nuked his own software. And because we all have, you know, uh, you know, awesome CI CD pipelines and we do a lot of, you know, let's just grab the latest version off of GitHub, everybody grabbed, or a whole bunch of people grabbed the latest version, which actually broke their entire app, right? So he purposely broke millions of websites to prove a point. Um, and that actually happens quite a bit. And we've seen this also with the rise of protestware. So people who are, you know, in, you know, like, uh, you know, fighting over in Ukraine, they've, you know, have, have their own little cybersecurity wing of, you know, anonymous hackers out there. And, you know, now people are starting to check for IPs. And if you're in Russia, the software works very differently than if you're in any other part of the, the, the world. Those types of things actually happen quite a bit. And it's now leading towards a new kind of like visibility into this. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm one of the people who thinks that government oversight of open source is probably a huge, you know, overreach. Uh, but now we're starting to see that open source is being pulled into it's a potential national security issue and how do we secure it and control the open source ecosystem and supply chain. Very, very different. So we're really swimming in kind of these really dangerous waters as we try to figure out, you know, what the open source community will look like in the next few years because we've got the investors who are coming in, we've got maintainers who are not being paid and can't sustain a living doing the things that they love, and now we've got the government kind of jumping in and trying to see what they can do to help with this or hinder it. Yeah, right? Um, so, you know, this is where we're, we're really at, and there's some big warning signs, right? The term open source now is being slapped on as a marketing tool. It's a way to generate companies' valuation, not necessarily to provide you with software that is open and freely available or that you can actually look at the source code even. Um, the open source as a freemium model uh, for an as a service offering is a growing trend where here you can get the free taste in the download. But really, if you want to do anything like back up your database, you need to pay for that, right? As a service where we'll run and control everything for you. Contributors aren't being treated well because if it doesn't lead to additional shareholder value or ROI, they're just going to ignore, you know, those features and they're going to ignore that portion of the community. Um, you know, so government regulation coming, you know, like I said, um, and expectations that, you know, hey, revenue needs to grow at all costs, even if it's at the expense of the open source movement is something that's really um, hurting us. 
Now, what can we do as, as a community? Um, we can support our maintainers, right? Uh, help them, you know, grow. And that can be through feedback. It could be through monetary support. It could be through, you know, um, contributing code, contributing articles on how you use the software. You know, a lot of maintainers and uh, people in the, the, the contributor space, they don't know how you're using the software. So they just make assumptions. They would love just to hear feedback. Feedback is probably the number one asked for thing in the communities that I work with because they, they, they're building the software, but does anybody care <laughs> about these features or the things that they're using? Um, but we need new business models. We need to rethink what open source success looks like, right? So it's not just the money we're looking at. It's not just what the shareholders want, the shareholder value. We need to figure out one that can treat maintainers and contributors as equals to investors and shareholders and not put shareholders above all else. And we need community-minded individuals who fall into these leadership roles. All too often, we're seeing that companies are buying their way on to open source you know, boards or open source you know, uh, communities where, oh yeah, we're gonna sponsor with a million dollars so we get to set the direction of this company's project or this, this project. That, that's kind of crazy, but it happens. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that happens, right? Where you'll no, no more open source for that, and you know, we'll just shut down the project. But we're at this space where I, I like to use this analogy: we have to figure out where we're going to take the open source community as a as a group, right? Which wolf do we feed? Um, you know, and we've got the one side where is you know where we've been in the open source community for some of us twenty, thirty years. Um, you know, where we're looking at that and saying. You know, like, this is how we grew up. This is how we built the communities. And now we've got this other group of people um, from the investor side who is trying to drag us into the way of shareholder value, revenue, profitability, you know, money at all costs, even if it means burning your bridges. And so which one are we going to allow to win? Um, and I think that that's where we have to make a choice. And as we start to use software, when we start, as we start to, you know, interact with different people on different projects, we need to decide that and we need to figure out where, what side of this fight we want to be on. That's my presentation. That's it. And I'm, I guess I'm like 10 minutes early. So happy to answer questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, for those who are watching online, do I see a problem with Amazon using open source software? The answer is no. Here's the thing. The great thing about open source is you can take it and use it, um, you know, uh, you know, across the board. I am not one for putting, you know, the restrictions, like, you know, from an SSPL perspective, you know, you can use this unless, you know, like, you know, you're, you're an Amazon or a, a Google. You know, you can build in, you know, different things that, that provide value to your customer base. Um, but really, realistically, you know, yeah, Amazon has the right to use the software. A lot of the open source movement that we've seen that we've grown in the last, you know, uh, 10 years is because we've had access to compute resources and things that Amazon's provided us that we wouldn't have had before. Um, and so it's kind of changed that paradigm. So I don't think that what the cloud providers are doing is necessarily bad. I think that they need to figure out ways to contribute back to a lot of the communities they've done. And they've tried to do that over the last few years. Um, but I, I still think that there's more that can be done there. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so our business model falls into that uh, kind of like hybrid space where it's like I mentioned the RoboCop space. So for us, we provide all of our software free and open. Um, we have versions of MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. Um, they're out in the open source space. What we've done is we've gone out and found the uh, enterprise features that generally Oracle or Mongo will put behind a paywall and make you pay a whole bunch of money for, and we bring them into the open source space. And so you should use it. Now, we believe that you should pay us because we're better and we'll bring you immense value by using us and help you get more efficient and better at delivering whatever you're trying to do. Um, and if we're not, then you shouldn't pay us, right? You know, so at, at a certain point, you know, if, if we're not living up to our end, then you shouldn't be locked in. So our, our philosophy has been keeping that open source ecosystem as open and free as possible. 
um, and then we'll provide you with additional value through you know our knowledge our expertise whether that's automated or not and nothing you can't do on your own it's just we'll do it more efficiently uh-huh great that's awesome oh yeah Depends on the company, right? So bigger companies, we still find that most um, are, if they're hybrid, it's still going to be a lot of proprietary in their data center, right? So they'll move, you know, kind of trickle to the cloud. There's some applications and some companies that simply won't move. And that's why you've seen a lot of cloud providers start to push into uh, um, off-cloud type of things like Outposts for AWS, right? Or Anthos for, for Google. Um, and now you're seeing the kind of shift towards Kubernetes as a potential multi-cloud play. And you're starting to see some of the vendors out there, and you know, I mentioned like Anthos, it's like, okay, how do we manage the open source or the, the multi-cloud uh, or the hybrid environments? So let's build the tools that you can subscribe to and use um, to help manage that. So there, there are, is some movement there. Um, I don't think it's really a one or the other. I think it just depends on the company size and demographics of it. Uh, but I think from an open source perspective, it, it's funny, most of the open source startups in the infrastructure space that I work with, talk with, um, and, and have had, you know, on my podcast or other places, they're all looking at, you know, as a service. And then if you want to run it on prem, you're going to do it with just community or best effort support with the idea eventually it will get so difficult you'll have to move to the cloud and have their support yeah yeah and i think that one of the the the, the cool things about the cloud is it's lowered the barrier to entry so much that a lot of people can do it. The scariest thing about the cloud is it's lowered the barrier of entry so much that a lot of people can do it, right? I know, like, I, I love my in-laws, but I don't want them touching anything in the computer space. The fact that they could spin up a server scares the bejesus out of me. I'm just going to say that right now, that it just scares me to no end. Um, and I think that, you know, we have done um, a, a great service in that, but we've also caused it so that lower barrier of entry has really um, caused us to just kind of become complacent. You know, so, you know, you say like, you know, hey, yeah, if you don't have the talent, then you're going to go to the cloud. Well, because we're, you know, we have an insatiable demand for more, you know, tech talent, right, developers, everything else, we're willing to lower the barrier and find people who are just used to clicking a button, right? I, I know a lot of people who they don't know how to write a query, right? You know, they're just going to, they're going to do whatever the ORM tells them. You know, they're going to, they've never been to a shell, you know, they, they, they can't write, you know, anything that's going to, you know, remotely be, you know, complex. And you end up having, you know, teams that have 50 of those people and then five people who are really hardcore, you know, back end folks, and you start to skew and change and evolve that ecosystem in the community. Yeah, it's a big problem, though, definitely. No, you feel free, man. Like, I, hey, I'm here all week, well, all weekend, you know, so... Well, so well, all of them do. I mean, like I think I, actually, I think big data. A lot of the analytics uh, companies that are out there, they 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 pitch to the developers because it's like it's a feature discussion, right? So when you talk about like you know features, developers get features, right? So as you're building out new applications, you understand this feature makes you more productive. But when you're talking about like compute or you're talking about storage from a developer perspective, that's commodity, right? And so that's a whole different thing. Like how many developers do we have here? Oh, quite a few. How often are you thinking about like the compute resources, like the servers that you're installing on? 
a little bit, you know, a little bit, right? It's not, but it's not as much as you're thinking about like the code you're developing, the architecture you're developing. Um, and if I tell you like, you know, hey, there's this cool new thing that can, you know, do this awesome AI, you know, you know, uh, function that can take your data and tell you, you know, how much money you're going to make and when you're going to die in the future and all this other fun stuff, you're going to be like, oh, that's cool. I want to try it. But if I'm going to say like, ooh, I have storage that is, you know, 30 cents cheaper, um, you would probably be like, uh, cool. Um, let's go talk about those features again. Um, yeah. Yeah, no problems. Anyways, uh, feel free to stop by the booth. Um, you know, I'm talking tomorrow on database observability. So we're going to be l looking at how to tune and fix database problems. And then i um, going to talk about some of the fun, crazy things that I've seen in the open source space over the last 20 years on Sunday. So um, hopefully you'll come back for that. And I didn't bore you too much with the details in this one. So thank you very much. Ooh. Wait, I gotta take a picture of all you people in the room now. See, see, that, that'll go on my Twitter feed now. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> okay. You can heckle. It's fine. Uh, there already are, uh, so I've given this talk before, but um, I don't know if they'll do it officially through the conference. But um, yeah, I, I, I gave this talk at FOSDEM and then at one other place, so it's on YouTube already. And oh, okay. Slides are already out there, so if you kind of search for Matt, you know, you'll yeah, find I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. Take a look. I yeah, cool. Yeah, well, by the way, where do you work? Uh, okay. Uh, I run a oh, I live in Raleigh. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can. Yeah, well, it's, it's always, yeah, it's, it's funny because 